Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Bruce Marshall and this is a cont continuation of Accounting 251 with California Baptist online program. Today we're going to talk about corporations. Up until this point we have kept things fairly simple in terms of the organizational structure of the business and we've just assumed that we're talking about a sole proprietorship and that was necessary so that we could understand the basic debits and credits and how to account for for simple business transactions and we've now made our way through inventory liabilities fixed assets payroll and now it's time to talk about the corporation structure and there are going to be unique transactions that we'll have to learn those debits and credits for but let's get into first of all what we mean by a corporation it is a separate legal entity with its own tax return it does file a tax return with the IRS just like you as an individual have to file a tax return the ownership of the corporation is represented in shares of stock the stockholders, also called shareholders, own the stock in that corporation and they can then, after they have that stock, they can sell it and that transaction will not have any effect on the ongoing operations or the continue exist, continued existence of the entity of the corporation. Those shares of stock can be traded in public markets called and, and if a corporation has shares of stock traded in a public market it's called a public corporation and that is as opposed to a private company and when we talk about markets you're really talking about think of it in terms of a virtual situation just where you have buyers and sellers and so we we do have there is a physical element to some markets and of course the New York Stock Exchange has a floor in New York on Wall Street and but now as you know many trades are done electronically and of course the NASDAQ market NASDAQ is National Association of Securities Dealers and Quotations and that market is by definition virtual and the Chicago Stock Exchange is an example of, more, of a more regional exchange and it still is a physical location on LaSalle Street in Chicago and as we said if, if the shares of the, of the corporation are not traded publicly then it's a private corporation and sometimes you'll hear a term called LLs, or excuse me, a um, a subchapter S corporation, and that's in the subchapter S is a uh, notation of the IRS code, and that has um, certain limitations on the number of shareholders that can be uh, for that company. And another thing to note is that stockholders of a corporation have a limited liability, and that plays into the concept of what's called the corporate veil and this is just a picture I pulled off the internet and that we'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of the corporate structure but the veil being that the people who run the company and I think that's what they're picturing uh, kind of behind this veil um, or actually maybe this this person here is the one that's working for the corporation and then someone wanting to get at that person um, there is a corporate veil kind of standing between them and, it, and, and the whole idea is the is the limitation of the liability of this person of the stockholder the stockholders control the corporation by electing a board the board of directors and the board meets periodically to establish policy and to ensure that the management the senior management of the company of the corporation are doing what they're supposed to do now the chief executive officer uh, is the top employee of the corporation this will show you graphically what we're talking about here and kind of the hierarchy you have the stockholders that own shares of stock they elect a board of directors the board of directors then will elect key officers of the corporation and then of course you have the rank and file employees the other thing I added to this slide from the publishers is the fact that as I alluded to the chief executive officer almost always is also a member of the board of directors and you'll find many times where those senior officers and we'll use the term the C-suite C means the the letter C for the chief this or that the chief legal officer the chief financial officer the chief operations officer and so forth 
many times you'll have at least one or more of members of that C-suite that are also on the board of directors. And many times that, det that is determined based on the number of shares of stock that they really own. But again, there's a, a distinguishing term that we call management directors, which is our are the officers who also are on the board. And we did talk about the separate legal, exist legal existence of the corporation from the owners, who are the shareholders, and the transferable units of the ownership, which, which are shares of stock, and the limited liability feature. And of course, if a corporation is subject to taxes, there is a Form 1120 that the corporation must file. Now you can have a non-taxable corporation which is um, and they have to file an informational return called an 1120 NT which stands for non-taxable. But the fact that a typical uh, corporation is subject to taxes leads to what's called double taxation and we'll get into the, to the concept of dividends but um, basically to introduce that topic is you have income of the corporation that then is going to get taxed and then if there's a distribution of dividends to the shareholders, those shareholders as individuals will then have to pay taxes on that receipt of dividend. This table basically just takes you through the advantages of the corporation uh, uh, formation or the, the reason you would have a corporation is a separate existence, the continuous life that it has, um, and the ability to raise large amounts of capital. And of course, we saw that uh, just recently with Twitter that, uh, uh, that you know, they used the, the term went public. And Twitter, uh, prior to uh, just, um, I think it was today, yesterday maybe, um, going public, they were still a corporation. It's just that there was not a ready market. Uh, they were considered a private corporation. There wasn't a ready market uh, to, in, a, in which to share, to trade those shares of stock. And now, of course, the founders of Twitter are, are uh, very, very wealthy people, and, and that wealth can be converted easily into cash because they could sell the stock they have. And it's that, that's a transferability of rights and the limited liability we've talked about quite a bit. This slide is the disadvantages and where you have the owner is separate from management. This is a, really a very good point your authors are making. And it says that stockholders are supposed to control management through the board of directors. And here's the, the fallacy of that. The board of directors should represent shareholder interest. However, they're often more closely tied to management than they are to shareholders. And so you sometimes have that, uh, that disconnect and they may not always behave in the best interest of the stockholders. And I can tell you this, being not not that I'm all that jaded, but uh, many times you'll have you've heard the term a good old boy network, um, and it seems like once somebody is is serving on a particular board, they they actually serve on on several boards of directors, and so it's it's a classic case of not what you know, it's who you know. Um, the double taxation of dividends we alluded to, and that's where the corporation is paying tax on its income, but also then as they distribute those dividends, they get taxed by the individual who receives them. And of course, there are a lot of regulatory costs, and they allude to the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. Uh, this legislation, uh, not to lecture on Sarbanes-Oxley, but um, was really the result of, this, of the corporate financial reporting scandals, and there were quite a few in the late 90s and early, uh, early 2000s. And uh, so Congress enacted this legislation, and many companies tried to uh, delist or, or not or to, to um, go private so that they wouldn't be subject to the onerous requirements of Sarbanes-Oxley because their audit fees in some cases tripled, and, and we've seen those audit fees levelized now. But uh, it was, it was a pretty... Uh, uh, arduous uh, legislation and uh, and it was a burden to the company. And the first step is to informing a corporation is to uh, get an application of incorporation and you have to choose which state you're going to do that in. And state laws differ and so often uh, you'll find states with more favorable laws and, we'll, laws and we'll talk about some of those states in just a minute. And here we go, more than half of the largest companies are incorporated in Delaware. And one of the reasons for that also is the, um, the Delaware has a, does not have an intangibles tax. And the intangibles tax will be levied on your, on your um, shareholders' equity. So that's why many companies choose to, to go that route. And the company I work for actually is incorporated in New York. And here you see an example here where GE is incorporated in New York. But um, 
and of course Starbucks in Washington that makes sense but um, most of them are in are in Delaware and they also have a charter and articles of incorporation sometimes that um, can mean the same thing but uh, those are the the official legal documents that that have to be approved by the state in which you incorporate and of course then there are bylaws and operating rules um, and procedures for conducting the affairs and and really that's talking about what the uh, you'll find various committees on the board of directors the uh, the compensation committee uh, there's a compli compliance committee there's an audit committee so a lot of a lot of committees that are defined in these bylaws and this is a simple illustration of the organizational expenses that are that are expensed uh, or excuse me the the organizational costs and what you do with that and just go ahead and, and debit is charge expense uh, for those costs. Now we're going to talk a little bit about shareholders equity um, and that goes by several names um, investment capital capital but shareholders equity is the most common uh, phrase and it's really that that on the right hand side of the balance sheet and remember that you think of the balance sheet as an equation assets equals liabilities plus equity so that that equity instead of now being just a single individual that might uh, you know have a sole proprietorship now we're talking about the entire group of shareholders and, and what's on that right that very far right side of the balance sheet and here's a picture of that you really have two components the paid in capital is what came from the issuance of the stock on the market um, and uh, again if you're not publicly traded you can still have capital uh, that came from your stockholders it's just there's not a a market in which those uh, those shares of stock can be traded and the retained earnings element uh, is probably one of the most difficult things to understand but we'll talk about it in a minute too but the way it's shown here is it's reinvested earnings that's probably not the best way to think of it so uh, let's move on to another slide that, that uh, a little bit later that'll that'll explain that So here, net income is retained in the business, and that's that's how they're defining defining retained earnings. And essentially, though, I would I would define retained earnings as the cumulative net income or net loss. You could have a retained deficit since you started business, and of course, then it would be net of those dividend dividends that you paid out. This is a very simplistic look at that shareholders equity section of the balance sheet. So if you had paid in capital, you'd show that here, the retained earnings. And the only reason they're showing the slide is to show that the, it's the sum of these two numbers is your total stockholders equity. And if you only had one class of stock, in this case we do, you have common stock you also call it capital stock sometimes but there can be other classes of stock or types of stock and preferred stock is something we'll get into in a little bit later now retained earnings there here we go it is the cumulative net income that has not been distributed as dividends and I'm saying it's cumulative since the start of the company now dividends then you might guess are going to serve to reduce retained earnings they are distributions of the earnings to stockholders. Now you can have cash dividends and you can have stock dividends where you're just um, uh, really increasing the number of shares outstanding by giving uh, additional shares of stock to your existing stockholders. You have seen this illustration before. It's basically a timeline illustration from your balance sheet at the beginning of, of a period and the balance sheet at the end of the period and how you explain the change in your balance sheet really you have income or loss for the year but that income is closed out to retain earnings and of course as you are earning this income you're hoping that assets are getting bigger um, and so because you have to stay in balance assets equals liabilities plus equity as, as those assets are growing you're selling things for selling your inventory or whatever it is you do you're doing that for more than it costs you to do that so you make a profit and that turns into uh, hopefully cash ultimately so your assets are going up but your equity has to go up also and that's we close that net income then to retained earnings and here we show basically those two components of that shareholders equity now this is going to show a buildup, if you will, starting with net income, which we define as revenues minus expense, expenses, 
that flows into retained earnings, but the other element of retained earnings are dividends. And dividends are really uh, an outflow of assets from the company to the shareholders. But these two elements are make, make up your retained earnings, and that's a component of owner's equity, as the other component would be preferred in common stock. And then we'll bring it into the balance sheet, assets equals liabilities plus equity. And remember, the balance sheet is a, is a snapshot at any point in time. Now, a debit balance in retain earnings is called a deficit. How do you get there? Well, that's that's that net loss when you're you're not making money period over period, and so then that will that will create a deficit. And a credit balance um, is you've had a you know since inception you've had more net income than you've had any net loss. Now, the thing to realize that at any point, and remember, retained earnings is a part of the balance sheet, so it's a snapshot. So at any point in time, whatever you show in your retained earnings account does not represent cash or any surplus cash or cash left over. It's, 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 um, it's simply that. It's simply the mathematical accumulation of your reported net income or net loss since the inception. That's all it represents. You can't say, okay, if I have a million dollars of retained earnings, I must therefore have a million dollars of cash. For one, those assets on the other side, of the, on the left side of the balance sheet, uh, we're considering retained earnings is on the right side of the balance sheet, but those assets could be in the form of land, it could be in the form of buildings, it could be in the form of, of accounts receivable. Now, what I wanted to show you, uh, my students uh, that I lecture to know that I work for a company called Radnet, and I pulled this off the SEC Edgar website, and we are a publicly traded company, so our stock is traded out on NASDAQ, and so therefore you can look at all of our filings. And the 10K is an annual filing, and it shows, uh, among other things, it shows the balance sheet. Now, what I did was took a picture of kind of that, just that section of the balance sheet that talks about our shareholders' equity. And as you can see, we have a deficit, and we'll talk about par value of stock. But I want to note that look at our par value. It is one, uh, one, hundredths, one hundredth of one penny. So it's almost it's just infinitesimal. Now these numbers are in thousands, okay, in thousands. So you have to add three zeros. Uh, so that's not just four dollars. That's actually rounded to four thousand dollars. But if you took the number of shares we have outstanding, which is a little over uh, thirty-eight million shares, and multiply that by the par value, that's why that number is so small. Now, look at this negative number. That's actually a debit when we're talking debits and credits, and that's our accumulated deficit. That's a deficit balance in our retained earnings. Now, you can kind of peek here and see that total liabilities and equity are $715 million, and you can see our liabilities, total liabilities are $717 million, which is uh, quite a lot of liabilities. And then you can kind of then see down, I didn't show much of it, but our revenue for a, a year um, is about $650 million. So a pretty big company, but we're still struggling to show net income year over year, where we're trying to try, or we're finally starting to show some net income each quarter, but uh, it's fairly difficult to do. Number of shares of stock that you have authorized to issue is stated in your charter. Now we'll get to a illustration in just a minute, but you can you can have authorized a lot more shares than what you have issued out into the market. And the outstanding stock is is the number of shares at any moment that are actually traded or in the hands of stockholders. And this shows you this how the number of authorized is greater can be greater than the number of shares issued which also can be greater than the number of shares outstanding. Now the difference between this issued and outstanding shares could really be something like treasury stock. Treasury stock is when a company buys back its own stock from the open market. Those are still authorized shares and they're still considered to be issued. They're just not outstanding. Now the stock certificates are really a, a documentation of the shareholders ownership in the company. Now decades ago 
uh, when everything was done on paper, uh, you would expect, you know, there would be a lot of stock certificates, a lot of record keeping and, and um, you know, sending this stuff in the mail. Um, and, and that was that was pretty onerous. And, and we'll talk about in a minute how that has gone somewhat by the wayside to where in the in the age of the electronic uh, tools that we have, you don't need those those paper uh, certificates. We did mention about the par value, and it's really par value is really an arbitrary value that you establish uh, when you set up the corporation and, and, and say how many shares we're going to have, but you have to state what the par value is going to be. And this is where we uh, mentioned about the stock certificates. Um, you still can get them, but they're, they're kind of a uh, special case. <clears throat> now, speaking of special case, uh, showing a little bit of my personal life here, uh, I actually have been issued some shares uh, as as part of my compensation, and this was uh, this happens to be uh, 3,334 shares represented on this certificate. Um, yes, that's me, Bruce Marshall. Um, you can see our name, the name of our CEO is Dr. Berger, and there's our Chief Operation Operations Officer Norman Hames, who's also is the Secretary of our corporation. And you can see RadNet is incorporated in the state of New York. So uh, these actually, this actually is a certificate uh, for those shares that were that were issued to me as part of my compensation. Now, no par or stated value. Um, not to spend a lot of time on this, but you can, you can issue a no par stock. It depends on the requirement of the state in which you're incorporated. And um, this just says that there's a minimum uh, stockholder contribution called legal capital uh, to protect creditors. But you'll realize that um, in terms of uh, the, the creditors, that the stockholders are the very last in line. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. That if there's ever a dissolution of the company, if it ever just dissolves and ceases to exist, uh, you're gonna, the first people you're going to pay are going to be the lawyers and the accountants and the employees. Um, and there's a bankruptcy court that will basically kind of govern that. Or, uh, but in the end, there, there probably isn't going to be anything left over for the people that own stock. Uh, the major rights to company ownership are as follows. Uh, the right to vote uh, in matters concerning the corporation. You'll hear the term proxy. Most people don't physically go to a, a meeting to vote their shares, but they fill out a form, and it's called a proxy, that they can then vote uh, for whatever matters are being presented by the board. And the right to share in distributions of earnings of the corporation, and we'll talk about the the uh, distribution of dividends and how they actually first have to be declared by the board of directors. The right to share in assets upon liquidation. Uh, don't uh, hold your breath on that because there are very uh, not that many instances where you really have. Um, have money left over. Now that's in a in a in a adverse situation. Of course, a company can be purchased, and all of the the assets of the company can be purchased by another company. And then you know this company that receives all this cash, then they they could just distribute the money and and uh, cease to exist. So that would be a, a positive scenario where you came out uh, came out the winner. Now. This illustrates the o the entry that you would make when you issue stock. Uh, this would be uh, whether you are issuing it out to the open market and, and, uh, and becoming a publicly traded company. And so now you have this infusion of cash on the balance sheet. So you're debiting cash and you're going to credit preferred or common stock depending on what type of, of stock you issue. Now in this case, it's a very simple illustration because the number of shares that they, uh, that they issued uh, and the, the par value is really what dictated the price at which those stocks uh, were purchased and or, or were, were, issued, were sold, if you will. Now, that, that hardly ever is the case. Um, you, you could do a private company where you set this up and that represented that infusion of capital and maybe you only had one or two shareholders. And yes, it could work that way where you just you, you have the par value and that's the exact amount of money that, that the owners of the, of the stock are going to give you. But as we know with Twitter, um, I don't actually know what Twitter's par value was, uh, uh, but it could have been like an infinitesimally small number. But those, those stocks uh, issued for, for quite a bit. And then here you have a case which is typical. Uh, the stock is issued or sold for a price that is more than its par. And then you just call it a premium. And the opposite of that, if it's sold for a price less than par, it's, it's a discount. Don't get hung up on these terms. They're, they're, they're really of no consequence. Uh, 
Um, it just determines how you handle your entry. And of course, cash is cash. That's uh, pretty easy to determine. And then if you have any difference, um, you, you mathematically compute what that um, the par value is, uh, which is it's what's stated on the certificate or in the Articles of Incorporation, and then just plug your difference to what's called a, a paid in capital in excess of par. Now, in this case, you acquired land by issuing some stock. This obviously is not something you're issuing out on the market. It's uh, you want to get some land, and so whoever's selling the land is say, oh, hey, I'll take some shares of stock in your company. Now, the, you have to look at which is the more easily determined market value. And if, you're, if you do have a, an established market value on your stock, in this case it's $12 a share, um, that's, that's a more objective way to determine how you're going to then establish this land on your balance sheet. Now the only reason we, we care about market value um, is, is that initial purchase uh, or recording of land. And this, if you want to think of it as a purchase when you're issuing stock to get this land as a company. Um, of course, we could have paid cash for it, and we, in that sense, we would have just credited cash and debit land. But and, and we would have had to have gone with whatever that uh, that agreed upon amount is. And in this case, the more objective way to determine is to say how much stock we, did we issue for the land, and use that to then set up the land on our balance sheet. And of course, you remember that balance the, the the assets on your balance sheet. The amount we use to record those assets is the historical cost. Now we'll get into more advanced concepts if you want to uh, move toward becoming a CPA and taking all the additional accounting classes. Some of those assets, and very few of them, do you really have to mark to market and say what's the market value? You really don't care. It's always based on what you paid for it, the historical value, historical cost, excuse me. No par stock, we can go through this where they issue 10,000 shares at $40 a share, um, then additional shares at $36. This is just a very straightforward entry when it's no par. Some states require that the uh, entire proceeds from those star, no, no par stock be recorded as legal capital. Uh, again, it's a nuance, uh, really nothing to concern yourself with. And in this case, um, if they assign a stated value just because the, the the state requirement and again the thing to remember about this is how much did you get for it and then what's the legal stipulation on what you would credit as common stock and then just plug your difference okay and you can see in these cases the, the debits have to balance to the credit so this this last number is just a plug number Now, cash dividends, we talked about dividends earlier, about how that is a distribution of assets of the company in the form of cash, distributing those to your shareholders. And that is the, you know, the reason certain people like to buy certain kinds of stock, because there's a pretty healthy dividend associated with that stock, and they like that dividend income over time. Uh, so then they kind of have two streams of income, one being that, that, that cash dividend that might happen on a quarterly or annual basis, and then ultimately maybe they're going to sell that stock, and so that stock has grown in value. So the two streams would be the dividend payment and then the, the accretion and the value of the stock that they may have. Now, it talks about three conditions that must be met to pay a cash dividend. I can tell you one of those is the fact you better have a credit balance in your retained earnings. So that's when they say sufficient retained earnings. They don't mean, again, retained earnings doesn't, doesn't equate to a pile of cash because you could have a large credit balance in retained earnings, that's, that's a good thing, and have very little cash at that moment on your balance sheet. When they mean sufficient, they mean it needs to have a credit balance and enough to absorb that charge or that debit of, of dividends that you're going to close out to retain earnings. And sufficient cash means you better, you better get some cash if it's not sitting in the bank right now. And so you either draw down a line of credit or collect some receivables or somehow, somehow get cash in order to pay that, that dividend that you're declaring. And then the, really the first thing is there needs to be an action by the board of directors where there's a, an actual declaration of dividends. And this is what we call the date of declaration. It's when the board formally authorizes that these dividends to be paid. And they all will they will establish a date of payment and then that's going to create then a liability on behalf of the company.
the date of record means you, you do have to at some point uh, determine okay we're going to do it for everybody that owns a share of stock on this particular date and that date of record will you'll see that that affects the share price on the market of a stock when it starts to trade X dividends X dividends means just uh, it's after the dividends of, after the date of record and then the date of payment is, is obviously, you know, you declare it, and it's going to be as of uh, the, the date of record, as of the shareholders on that date, and then you finally get around to actually cutting the checks uh, to those shareholders. Now this just shows some of the mechanics here where they're saying, okay, per share it's $2.50, and it's the shares outstanding of 5,000. So simple math is 250 times 5,000 to say the dividends would be 12,005 on the preferred, and on the common, 30 cents a share, and you had 100,000 shares outstanding. So that's how you get your 30,000, so your total dividends are 42,500. And on the declaration date, that's the, that's the date that they incur this legal liability which is when the, the board of directors has establishes this declaration, or they, they have a declaration of dividends. And so this is the entry you'd make on your books, is to go ahead and record that payable. Now, the dividend account is a debit balance, but it is not considered an expense in the sense that it does not show up on the income statement. It has the same effect of an expense, i.e. it's a debit, i.e. is closed to retained earnings, but it does not show up on the income statement. Now the date of record we talked about, and that merely determines who's going to receive the dividends that were declared to be payable. Now when you finally get around to paying it, then you get rid of the payable by debiting the payable, and you credit cash. Classes of stock we talked about, there are two primary classes, and that's common and preferred. And the reason there's an attractiveness of preferred stock over common stock is the preference relative to the dividends. And this shows um, just kind of a cue, and the, there's an order, a pecking order, if you will. And you can see those preferred shareholders are standing in front of the common shareholders in this line where it says, here's the money we have available to pay dividends. And, of course, we said that the payment is authorized by the Board of Directors. And when they authorize it, they're saying to have declared a dividend. Now, cumulative preferred stock has the right to receive regular dividends that were not declared or paid in prior years. Cumulative preferred stock is really uh, a pseudo-debt, if you will. It's almost like a loan, in that, in that where, where a debt has regular interest payments that must be paid, Cumulative preferred stock is, is very similar to that, even though it's considered equity. But there is a, a preference that they have, and they're going to, if, if they're, you go by a year or two and didn't declare any dividends, they're going to have, you're going to have to catch them up on that. Non-cumulative preferred stock then does not have that right. If, if the board decides not to declare dividends in a given year, then the non-cumulative preferred stock people do not get a dividend. But cumulative means they have a, have a right to get it, and then there's an arrearage that's associated in a year where the dividend was not declared or paid. Now we're going to pause right now and go through a problem that discusses that cumulative preferred stock. Okay, folks, we're going to get into a problem that illustrates the dividends that we pay to preferred and common stockholders and the nuances or the differences between preferred stock and common stock as it relates to a publicly traded company. So you can read what the setup is here. We've got a publicly traded company, and we're going to talk about a six-year period of time. So I'm going to get into a, an inking mode here so I can draw some pictures and, and show you what's going on with some of these numbers. So we have 10,000 shares of preferred stock, and the problem just goes ahead and just tells you it's $2 per share. Now we could easily have said that it is a 4% preferred stock. And 4%, if, I, if we had given you that and not given you the dollar amount, you take the 4% times the $50 par, okay, and that's where you, that's where you get your 2 bucks a share. And so it's $2 a share, it is cumulative, and it's non-participating. Those are two key words here. Cumulative meaning that if you do not pay what you owe them every year, then it's going to accumulate. 
So what do you owe these preferred shareholders every year? Well, at $2 a share and 10,000 shares, you're going to owe them $20,000 each year. And remember that preferred stock is similar to debt in that you have like interest payments on debt. You also have a payment that you must make to the preferred shareholders. The fact that it's non-participating, this descriptive term here, means that once you satisfy what you owe them, then you, they do not participate beyond that amount in any kind of excess that's been declared by the board of directors. Okay, so that's your setup there. Common shares, we have 25,000, $10 par. Remember the par value on common stock is relatively arbitrary and something you only really did when you set up the company in the particular state in which you incorporated. So what do we have in the problem? We have a six year period and we give the years here. We have the declarations by the board of directors in each year. And then the problem is asking you to say how much money do the preferred shareholders get to distribute among themselves and then how much is left over for the common shareholders to have. Now the fact that this is a cumulative preferred stock means that you're going to have to keep a, a ledger card over here of your arrearage. So if you have anything in the current year, so we'll say the current year arrears, okay that's what you added or uh, what kind of action basically on, on what the declaration was. And then let's just keep track of the cumulative arrearage. Okay. Because it is going to accumulate if you don't pay them in any given year what you owe them. So in the first year, the board declared $30,000. So of that $30,000, you owe 20,000 to the preferred shareholders and that leaves 10,000 for the common. So the good thing is in this year you had nothing going on in your arrearage because you owe the preferred shareholders remember 20,000 each year. Now look what happened. Year 2, 2008, you declared $15,000. Well all of that goes to the preferred shareholders, nothing goes to common and you just added a $5,000 amount that you're going to keep over here in this ledger card of an arrearage to the preferred shareholders. Now also remember this, not to complicate things, but that $5,000 is not going to be recorded on the books as a liability to the preferred shareholders. It's just you're going to keep it over here in case you, you have a dividend declaration in the future. So it's not part of your operations and so you don't go and accrue this and, and debit any kind of expense and credit liability. So don't confuse yourself. All you're doing is keeping a tally over here of what you owe these guys and gals. So you now are, have accumulated $5,000 in that. The $10,000 amount declared in 2009 is going to go entirely to the preferred shareholders. The common shareholders get nothing of that. And you just added another $10,000 to this amount, this accumulate, accumulation that you owe preferred. So you're now up to $15,000. It gets worse. In 2010, you, the board only declared 4000 and guess who gets that? The preferred shareholders. Common gets nothing. And furthermore, you now just added to your tally, of, you added $16,000 to that accumulation. Cumulatively, you owe them 31000 Again, not a liability of the business in the sense that you owe them but you're going to have to pay, if you ever do declare any more dividends into the future, you've got to satisfy this before the common shareholders get anything. And remember that cue, that line that we showed in the PowerPoint slideshow where there was a booth that said here's the money available and the very first people in line were the preferred shareholders. Now look what happens. In this year we had a declaration of fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Now, the key thing is, in every year, the preferred shareholders are entitled to get $20,000. So of that 50, the very first 20,000 goes to the preferred shareholders. But let's also look at what's going on in this accumulated arrearage over here. 
you could think of it this way if we go back to our inventory uh, knowledge like on a FIFO basis the first thing the, f the, the first uh, item that you have to pay off is this $31,000 of arrearage okay so they're going to get the 31,000 and they're also entitled to 20,000 in the current year so here's what happens the entire 50,000 goes to the preferred shareholders nothing goes to common and really all you did was was you know if I want to I can take and show this as a negative thirty thousand dollars because I pulled down thirty thousand of what I owed them and remember I you know I owe them twenty thousand every year but I had accumulated thirty one thousand so now that arrearage is down to a thousand dollars okay so you might want to pause the recording or the, the video and and just kind of focus on the mathematics very simple mathematics addition and subtraction but but you have to say how did I get to that amount okay so now this is where your common shareholders are going to be happy that the preferreds are non participating because you only are are required to give them twenty thousand in any given year and you're also required to satisfy the accumulated arrearage so guess what they're going to get in this last year they're going to get twenty one thousand okay now where did that twenty thousand dollars come from that is the twenty K that you owe in the current year and every year and it's also this one thousand dollars we'll call it one thousand equals the twenty one thousand okay then the $21,000 completely satisfies the preferred shareholders and so then I take the $21,000 from that $75,000 and get $54,000 to my common stockholders okay so hopefully that made sense go back the real the real bugger on this one comes kind of in these two years making sure that you that you keep things straight as far as satisfying the arrearage and knowing that you have to give these guys twenty thousand every year and then you know seeing how when you have these big years of, of declaration how much are they entitled to get and because it's non-participating then the rest of it goes to the common shareholders okay let's finish up our learning about corporations and dividend transactions by talking about just a few more concepts uh... The first of which is stock dividends stock dividends are are distributed to their to stockholders in terms of additional shares of stock this is a alternative an alternative to a cash dividend that we talked about earlier this example shows you that in december the board of directors declared a 5% stock dividend of 100,000 shares and all they're doing is taking that percentage times the number of shares outstanding and then they have to then say when are those shares going to be issued to which shareholders on record and it's on record as of December 31st but the key thing here is the market price of that stock on the day they declared it was $31 a share and that's going to drive the accounting entry that we'll talk about here on the next slide where they debit stock dividend stock dividends and credit the liability if you will of stock dividends distributable and then of course we're going to clear out that liability on the date that those dividends actually get distributed to the shareholders and now this paid in capital in excess of par what we're doing here is using that market price of thirty one dollars a share and basically then we're plugging that number um, if, if you want to think of the $31 a share times the number of shares that they distributed which was a hundred thousand and then the par value is what drives this two million dollars here and so that's where you get that plug of 1.1 million now the um, the amount that is um, at the end of the period is reported in the paid in capital and then the effect of this uh, is essentially just to transfer a, a piece of retained earnings because you're going to close out that stock dividends distributable to the retained earnings account again it has a debit balance and will get close to retained earnings and remember that when we had cash dividends payable the same kind of thing happened you had a debit down, debit balance in cash dividends uh, and that got close to retained earnings so here we're just taking a piece of retained earnings and then turning it into common stock this illustration then is the um, 
the credit to common stock from that liability of dividends distributable. And there's that $2 million. So now you've got to have a par value coming into common stock when you actually issue it. Now the way to look at the, uh, the ownership percentage, you had a 6% dividend that was paid out and they had, um, let's say, assume that there was 10,000 total shares issued. And so now there will be, after the dividend, 10,600. And there's the illustration on how to get that in mathematics. And let's say you had a single shareholder uh, that owned a thousand shares, and then when they got their stock dividend, they got an additional 60 shares, and so now they have a thousand and sixty shares. And you can see that uh, uh, mathematics there. And so, therefore, it's the same percentage ownership. This, if you had 10,000 shares outstanding and they own 10% of it, the same percentage uh, carries forward after the dividend uh, transaction is complete. Treasury stock is different than common stock. What's happening in Treasury stock, a company is buying its own shares on the open market. Now, there are a number of reasons that that happens. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some headlines, but here are the, the textbook reasons. Um, you may want to have some shares then that you're going to either give or resell them to employees. You could resell them maybe at a, at a reduced price to uh, give your employees uh, a break. Um, reissue them as bonuses where you're just actually giving it to, the, to, to your employees. Uh, and, as, and then, of course, there would be a taxable uh, event to the employee because of that. And then to support the market price, and the reason that happens is the company, uh, when, they, when they buy their own stock off the market, those are considered to be authorized shares, but obviously they're not considered outstanding shares. Um, they're not floating around on the market. So anytime you reduce the quantity that's on the market, then essentially you, you will have a, uh, or theoretically, a proportionate increase in the price because of the, think of, think of economics and the scarcity because you, now you've, you've made things more scarce or you've actually just reduced the amount out there. The other reason you could do this, it's more in, in the headlines today with Apple uh, or even Tesla, um, but Apple is a case where um, they had so much cash laying around and if a company uh, thinks that its stock might actually be undervalued uh, than, what it, than what they think it is, and it may be a reason to buy that off the open market um, and then they can reissue it later. Now Tesla is a case where just recently, that's the, manu the electric car manufacturer, that stock is at an astronomical price relative to the earnings and, um, and actually the CEO of the company, Elon Musk, has, um, has kind of warned that it's a little bit too high price. So, uh, so Tesla wouldn't be a situation where they would go out and use some of their cash to, to buy their stock on the open market. It's just way too high priced. So in this case, you've got um, a Treasury Stocks trans transaction. Uh, they buy it at a market price, and that's what sets your $45. Um, and this happens to have a $25 par, so it's um, um, 1,000 shares are buying at $45. So you debit Treasury Stock for that, credit cash. Now, the reason you're not messing around at all with your common stock or paid-in capital, because all you're doing is just bringing these shares into your, to your um, holdings and letting them sit there until you figure out what you're going to do with them. Now, Treasury stock is what's considered a contra equity, meaning it has a debit balance, and so it serves to reduce your total shareholders' equity when you report it. Now, here's when they decide what to do with some of those Treasury shares, and in this case, they sold them uh, just on the open market, so they're going to have an infusion of cash, debit cash, uh, for the 36000 which is your market price of sixty times the number of shares that they sold. And then you take that out of Treasury stock, and then you're going to have a paid-in capital, in this case, of, of $9,000. And they show you where the $9,000 comes from, and that is the, um, the amount that uh, the, these shares were held in Treasury stock uh, versus the amount they sold it for. And remember, they sold it for $60. Um, and, but they had, had brought it in at $45. And then they, they took the remaining 400, 400 shares, um, and it looks like they did the same thing. It's just the market price had changed. 
So in this case, um, the market price went down, so they have a debit to paid in capital because remember it went into Treasury stock at $45, came out at $40. Uh, and this actually is not a not a good thing per se, but nevertheless, that's to illustrate that you can also have a debit here to paid in capital versus the credit that you had in the previous slide. Now the reporting of shareholders equity, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because there's different, there are different um, formats you can follow and you can, you can read these slides on your own, you can follow along in the book, but what I'm going to do is get to an actual presentation from the company I work for which is Radnet. And, um, but anyhow, they're giving you basically two different methods. And the first that we'll show on the next slide, um, you can you can have each class of stock followed by the paid in capital related to that common stock, or excuse me, that class of stock, and then have your retained earnings uh, afterwards. And here's the illustration of that, where you've got uh, each each type of stock, preferred, common, and then the the uh, paid in capital associated with it, and then your retained earnings down here. And there's your your deduction. Remember, Treasury stock is a, it reduces uh, shareholders' equity. Second method is you will have um, a single item presentation of your paid in capital. Uh, then you're followed by retained earnings, and that's what you've, you've got going on here. And again, Treasury stock is really handled the same way in each of these methods. Changes could be uh, in retained earnings can be done in one of two ways. It depends on how big and complicated your company is. You could have a separate retained earnings statement, or you could just put the retained earnings in with the um, the uh, income statement. Um, and because income, remember, uh, income or loss will serve to either uh, in increase or reduce retained earnings in a period. Or you could have uh, a statement of shareholders equity and this is what you really see most of the time this is what we'll illustrate illustrate with uh, Radnet's 10k so in this case uh, you have retained earnings and then uh, what the effects of, of net income or your dividend transactions where you where you um, uh, paid your, your preferred or common stock dividends and remember the dividends all they serve the, although they serve to reduce retained earnings they are not reported as an expense on the income statement now the re the restrictions of retained earnings the, the the most important concept to get here and we said this before in the other slides Retain earnings does not re represent some corresponding pile of cash that your business has. But the reasons you may restrict it um, could be legal reasons uh, ba you know, based on state law. They could be uh, based on some contract you have or an appropriation. But again, the word appropriation I think tends to confuse people and they think that, oh, I'm going to appropriate this, this piece of uh, uh, of an asset or this 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 bank account balance that I have, and I'll carve off some of it and put it into this little separate account, and that's not the way to view this. Um, it's just it's just more of a paper type of entry that you do uh, in, in in sectioning off, I guess, your retained earnings, and you can classify that it's either a legal reason that you do it or a contractual reason or discretionary. But again, it's not. Don't get hung up on this because you really don't see it that much in practice. And it, 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 it tends to confuse people in terms of uh, retained earnings um, because it does not, retained earnings does not re represent a corresponding cash balance. Prior period adjustments, are th those happen uh, when you uh, made a mistake in a prior year and you have to have to catch that up and there's, there's basically a cumulative effect and so many times you'll just take that straight into retain earnings. Reason being is retain earnings has been impacted by your prior uh, periods where you've had net income or net loss and then if you find out you made an error in the way you recorded those, you can catch it up just by doing this prior period adjustment and take it straight into retain earnings. Now, the statement of stockholders' equity. This is where I want to illustrate. Um, you know, this is this is typical, uh, where you're showing in one big picture what's happening to all the components of stockholders' equity. And remember, your components uh, primarily are retained earnings and your uh, various classes of stock. Now, this slide is extremely busy, but this is exactly what you see uh, for Radnet uh, on our 10K that's filed out on the SEC's website and this uh, URL address you can paste that in if you want and Edgar just so you know Edgar is the uh, reporting site or kind of a it's a it's a uh, subcomponent of the SEC website 
and this is where you can get any kind of filing on a public company the financial filings mainly that's the 10q the 10k uh, the um, s8 uh, the, uh, the there's a thing called the def 14a which is the proxy statement and those are all good pieces of information on a company and here what you have it's a statement of shareholders equity or in this in our case it's uh, shareholders deficit and you have segregated this between common stock paid in capital uh, the accumulated deficit and so forth and basically you can look at this as a roll forward because you're taking a balance starting in January of 2010 and going all the way to the end of 2012 and so that's what accountants call a roll forward um, and so our statement of, of shareholders equity is is a pretty big uh, complicated roll forward a stock split we all should be so lucky to have stock splits and this is where uh, I think a lot of people really get wealthy in terms of they hold a stock for a long time and basically the it's it's a board of director declaration and if you have a stock that's trading at a very high uh, price per share one of the reasons you may do a stock split is to get that price per share down and so there should be a corresponding reduction in that share price based on whether it's a two for one or a four for one stock split and we can illustrate it here with basically um, uh, shares of a piece of pie uh, in this case you had uh, four shares at hundred dollars uh, per share and now you have 20 shares at twenty dollars uh, par value so you reduce that par value by the proportionate amount and of course what happens out on the open market is all of a sudden uh, there there is that um, that many more uh, shares that are trading and so you just expect that market price to come down uh, proportionally based on the number of shares. Now the thing to note is that the stock split does not require any journal entry on your books. All you're doing is you're just changing uh, the par value and you're, you're also changing the number of shares that that company now has considered to have um, authorized and issued. Earnings per share is a very important concept when you get into finance and and, uh, and you talk about in, in economics and you talk about stock markets um, and the, the most common thing you hear uh, it uses this thing called earnings per share as a component and of course your your CPAs that are auditing your books are saying is that net income number correct and how do I use that number to then calculate my earnings per share and and basically it's net income minus the preferred dividends and then you divide that the denominator is the average number of common shares outstanding now it comes into play when you've heard um, the term PE ratio or price it's called the price earnings ratio so if the market price of the stock divided by the earnings per share that's what gets you that PE ratio and the if you are a stock trader or you want to to look at buying some stock maybe what you want to do is look at whether that PE ratio is is a low number and maybe if it's anticipated you're going to have more earnings in future years um, then that in, that's anticipated to increase so you'll have some really wild swings in terms of PE ratios of a stock and I think right now of course we're near the end of 2013 Ford stock may be traded around nine nine um, uh, PE ratio of 9, meaning a price per share of Ford stock divided by the earnings per share is 9. Um, and then you, you have stocks that sometimes are trading uh, as high as 80, uh, uh, which, is, which is just a very astronomical number on the PE ratio. Okay, that concludes our Chapter 13 lecture. I hope you uh, have learned quite a bit and get back into the book if any of the concepts are not clear to you. And I thank you for your time and attention.